around COVID-19 could cause distress through the loss of employment, loneliness and homelessness. This is hurting people, uh, not just in terms of, I don't have enough money, but it's hurting people in their mental state, in their, their lives, in so many ways. A report co-authored by Wesley Mission makes recommendations to address the needs of people during and after the pandemic. They include a call for suicide prevention training for frontline Centrelink staff. Suicide Prevention Australia CEO Nevis Murray says the government must also soon an announce an extension to JobKeeper. The reason being that the longer we protract that decision, the more distress that people who are in those circumstances will experience. Those economic downturns lead to distress for people and communities. And we know for a fact that that level of distress uh, results in increased risk of suicide. Welcome to this important occasion when we're meeting together to, to engage in a conversation about a very important subject at this point in time. But before we share in this webinar, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, there are lots of different locations that we're meeting today and therefore the land on which wherever people are meeting, listening or viewing this particular um, webinar. We recognise the First Peoples and we recognise at the same time the respect that we hold for them and their elders past and present. But I also add to that um, a special acknowledgement of those people for whom suicide and mental illness is a lived experience. And so this isn't just something that we're talking about and recognising that we're talking out of something that is foreign and strange to people's experience, but very much part of that experience. Your voices, your presence and your sharing with us is important. The paper is an important paper and we've acknowledged the paper in terms of uh, re reducing distress. Lots of people when they talk about the subjects that we're talking about today think of it merely in one particular um, area of mental illness. We're recognising that mental illness and suicide is affected by a whole host of community activities and events that are going on in the community. Joining me today is Christine Morgan, National Suicide Prevention Advisor to the Prime Minister and CEO, importantly, of the National Mental Health Commission. Good to have you here, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also at the same time, Rebecca, Rebecca uh, Burdick Davis, who's with us, Director of Policy Advocacy and Government Relations for Suicide Prevention Australia. Thank you, Keith. Suicide Prevention Australia and Wesley Mission have partnered in the presentation of this white paper. Our intention is to begin a conversation. It is to make people aware of the issues that are so important in relation to distress in our community and our intention to seek to reduce that distress in the things that we're about. We've partnered together to produce this paper because we believe it's best talked about together and a partnership of the kind that we've engaged here is certainly something that's important in the light of the present pandemic uh, across Australia and indeed across our world. So we're talking about COVID-19 obviously and the effects of, of, of that and where we are at this point in time. So Christine, I'm, I'm going to ask you, first of all, there's no doubt that this is a watershed event. None of us sat here could have imagined no. that what this is going to be like. What do you think, uh, if I were to ask you the question, how are we faring, do you think? Oh, look, what a good question. What a good question. And I think it's really relevant to be saying, how are we faring? at the moment, uh, not just go back to say February when it all started, when we were all sort of in this cataclysmic, my goodness, we didn't even know what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, so how are we faring? We are faring still in, a, in circumstances which give us really heightened anxiety. That anxiety may have shifted a little bit for some of us from being really frightened about our physical security, though some of that's coming back with what's happening at the moment with um, further um, restrictions coming back in. It's very much around our economy. It's very much around our livelihood. It's around the future for our children. Um, it's, it's anxiety, Keith. It's really getting to us. And I think that whether we came into this with mental health challenges or not, I think it would be hard to say that any Australian 
mental health wasn't affected. You've just mentioned some of those things like uh, economics and, mm. and issues. I think that's one of the important things, is not just to put this in a box and say, we're just going to talk about this yeah. as though this is a health issue. That's right. Or an econ it's all of it, isn't it? It's all of it. And I think that was one of the cataclysmic things about it, that whilst it was a, an illness that was affecting us, the way we had to manage it, the way we had to respond to it, has had this effect across every part of our lives. You know, the way we, where we live, how we work in, in the, those places, how we work with each other, how we interact. Um, I often say, Keith, we came off the bushfires in January mm. and the, the palpable lesson from that, that everybody said was we want to connect with each other. Mm. We want to be really close. You know, we relied on our neighbours. And there we were two weeks later, stay, <laughs> stay away. Mm. So just how we even grapple with that is pretty amazing. And I suppose the question that I just want to conclude before I, I, I turn to Rebecca in her particular area is, how do you think we're faring in terms of a new uh, danger that's around? Do you think, uh, have we got a bit too lax about the whole thing? Look, I don't know if we've got lax. I think we've been reminded that this is not something that we can necessarily eliminate at this stage. Oh. I think we're faring in a number of ways. I think that it is certainly for some people brought out new depths of resilience, mm. but for many others, it's also brought out, I don't know how to do this. And I have heard from so many people that they have had to reach out for the first time to mm. others. Mm. And the way we enable that, the way we respond to that is so critical mm. in terms of being able to help people find the ways and the strategies to get through. Rebecca, yours is a different uh, kind of world with, with the same interest and concern. Mm. How do you think we're dealing with it? Do you think we're dealing with it well? Well, I think it's difficult to give an assessment because it's just, uh, as Christine mentioned, this is a black swan event. We've, we've never seen a crisis like this before, certainly in my lifetime, but I think within the lifetimes of most Australians now, I mean, obviously there's, there's Australians who've lived through world wars, but this is a pandemic that we haven't seen since the Spanish influenza, which was back in the twenties. Uh, but I think, there's a lot of things we can be proud of in Australia. So our government, first of all, uh, really sprang into action a lot more quickly than governments internationally. So we had a coordinated public health response and we can see that with uh, the way that COVID-19 caseloads are being managed. Mm. And we had an incredibly coordinated response um, from a mental health perspective. So we're very privileged to have Christine here uh, to speak with us in this discussion today. We saw the entire uh, government and mental health sector swing into action to ensure that people had a number of different options to go to for support. So I think there's a lot to be proud of in the way that we've responded. But I guess if I reflect on the reasons why we embarked on this report, we can't kind of, we can't sort of be static in the way that we've responded to this situation. And I think uh, coming from the perspective of Suicide Prevention Australia, mm. as a national peak body, we thought, well, here's an opportunity to um, inform government or, or perhaps inform some of the considerations for government in the next few months. And I think it sees next few months that will be really critical. Um, a, a, that was a flavour, I guess, of the research that we reviewed as well from mm. previous pandemics like SARS and mm. H1N1 virus. The first few months of the pandemic, people really came together in the community and came together as one. It's those months afterwards where some people feel the most acute impact. And that's what we want to, that's what we want to assist and support. And we're glad to, to work with you. And one of the, the, the areas that we've been involved in is setting up a whole host of networks from that's Wesley right. Mission across the country. And one of the things that's certainly true is that people have had to deal with this issue in the locale. They've had to mm. deal with it in isolation, not just an individual isolation, yes. but organisational isolations as well. And so mm. that's been a, a great, it's good to work with you guys. Do you expect things to change in, in the coming months? I wish I had a crystal ball, but I, I, of course things will change because, I mean, we've just seen, I think, three weeks ago when we, when we thought of the title for this report, which is perhaps not as apt as it was when we thought of it, we felt we were, Australia at least, was emerging from the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, like New Zealand did. I think New Zealand's eliminated, basically eliminated. COVID-19 and then we've seen the unfortunate situation unfold in Victoria so I can't really forecast where we're where we're going to head but mm. I think from the perspective of reducing distress we can expect I think quite confidently this is what our economists are telling us across Australia we can expect there to be some impacts on business we can expect there to be impacts on people's jobs and I think uh that's a critical concern for Wesley Mission, who mm. we were so proud to partner with mm -hmm. on this report. And it's certainly a critical concern for us because 
we do know there's a relationship between uh, people's wellbeing and their security of their finances and employment. So I think, I think we can forecast that. I'm glad you've talked about th those things because I, I, I suspect, uh, Christine, your answer to this question would relate to whole of government, mm. really. Um, and, you know, not only states coming together, we were last discovered, you know, it doesn't matter if we've had historically different railway lines, this is a very important together moment, it's, isn't it, it is, really? It really and, and looking forward, how do you see the good coming out of this in terms of whole of government response? The first thing, the first thing I'll say on that is that the national cooperation is, I used the word before, palpable. It's palpable mm -hmm. in Canberra, but also um, whether you go up to Macquarie Street here or Spring Street down in Melbourne, um, it is palpable. People are saying, how can we come together? With, with what's happening in Victoria, it's very much about there are colleagues. Mm -hmm. There are colleagues. How can we actually help that? So I think, mm -hmm. I think that sense of not only we can come together, but by coming together, picking up on your point, Rebecca, yeah. um, it has enabled the government to have a really coordinated response. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing, Keith. I think the second thing is a new sense of agility instead of kind of stumbling over all of those blocks we have in our federated Westminster model about how do you get decisions made, we're saying, actually, we've only got yeah. 24 hours to make this decision, if not less. Mm -hmm. So let's just do it. And so I think um, that agility has come. So when we were putting the pandemic mental health and wellbeing response plan together, which brought all nine jurisdictions together, um, that, that sense of being able to do things differently was really critical. And the third thing, the third thing, and I think this has been really good for mental health in Australia, is what we've looked over the parapet. We've said, we're no longer just going to wait for people to come to us. We actually need to go to them. And in suicide, as mm. Rebecca and yourself mm. would know, I mean, half of the people we unfortunately lose to suicide have not been in touch with mental health services. So there is that imperative for us to say, let's not wait. Let's actually get out there and, and meet people with where they're at. Christine, over the years, we've known each other and we've seen the development mm. of the way in which people have talked about suicide more openly now yeah. than they used to be. I can remember only 15, 20 years ago when you talked about this with the media and journalists and they would say, the voice would lower and, right. and they would even yeah. say to you offside, I'm not sure we should talk about this. Mm. Well, we should. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I, I wonder if, in fact, coming out of this might be some more openness about this important subject that we've is, still got it. You are so right, Keith. It is so critical. I think it is. We do need, we, we need to acknowledge that um, for, we, we lost 3,046 people, as we all know, in 2018. But how many more people attempted in that time? Yeah. So how many families? And if you look at it, about 130 people, we estimate, are impacted by every suicide. So this, this touches people. Mm. I think one of the critical things, though, is, and I think Rebecca would agree with me on this, is that not only do we need to talk about it, it's how we talk about mm. it. And I think, I think we need to really move away from the alarmist. Um, I don't think that gets us mm. anywhere. I think what we need to do is to talk about it in terms of normalising it, saying suicide ideation is a lot more common than we give it uh, credit for, and really putting out there that message of hope because it's when people lose hope, as we know, mm -hmm. that they reach those crisis points. So it's about how we talk about it. It's about saying, yes, we need to normalise it, but we also need to couple that with a sense of suicide's not inevitable. It may, it may be a lot more common, and suicide ideation is certainly a lot more common mm -hmm. than we would want it to be, but suicide is not inevitable, and that's a really critical message. Rebecca, the white paper mm. rightly points to areas other than what we would traditionally call mental health areas and, yes. and suicide, and that's been purposeful, isn't it, in the report? It certainly has. It really goes to the heart of, I mean, Christine has, has talked about this, about uh, a whole of government, whole of community approach to suicide, and that if I think of a reason for being for, for me and for the policy team of Suicide Prevention Australia, that's it, to drive or to try and influence that approach. Um, I think that uh, Wesley Mission has and brought an incredible amount of credibility. You've got hundreds of years or a couple of hundred years of delivering services to people in communities across Australia. And that was really fantastic because it meant that we had on the ground insight into the things that are affecting people right now. And what we heard from Wesley is 
people are being affected by feeling lonely. People are being affected by uh, issues with drug and alcohol. Uh, people who are homeless are, of course, feeling the impacts of COVID-19 acutely. But I will turn to Christine's point, which is about um, positivity and sharing sure. messages of hope. And that's really what this report is designed to be. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to strike fear in anybody's hearts. We didn't want to make predictions about increases in suicide because that is the last thing that we would want to do. Mm -hmm. um, what we've, mm -hmm. I guess, tried to do is say, government has this wonderful national mental health and pandemic response mm -hmm. plan. Here are some additional things that governments mm -hmm. might consider mm -hmm. as they implement yeah. that plan. And here are some things, here's a way for us to approach suicide prevention, which really gears up everybody in the community. It makes suicide everybody's business in a positive sense mm. in that we all want to prevent suicides from happening. And, and also gives us the, um, it's not the right, but the, the privilege of being able to talk mm. about those issues such as finance, homelessness. That's right. Uh, all the things that we know are a part of the, the, mm. the story that's knocking on the door at this particular uh, mm. point in time. And that's why I'm pleased that this is about a partnership. Um, and I, I think, this doesn't give us um, opportunity to bang the drum. What it mm. does do is say, look, here is the issues. It is an all of nation issue. That's it's right. an all of people issue. And there's hardly anybody not affected by it in some That's way right. or another. So let's move on to the tricky stuff, because it is tricky, really, talking <laughs> about economics and talking about yeah. well-being. Um, and there's a lot of people making speeches about, um, uh, you know, I, I, this has got to happen, this has got to happen from left and right in terms of, of politics. All of us know um, that, that really there are issues about economics and the National uh, Mental Health Commission is aware of that as much yeah. as anybody else. Do you have any comments about how businesses and workforces can thrive even in conditions like this? That is a really hard question. I knew you'd throw me a really hard one, Keith, and that, that one is how businesses can thrive. I actually think that if you strip away the, the bits that business does, you know, what their business is, it actually comes down to their people, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It comes down to there is no business, even in the, the digital age, that can exist without its workforce, without its people. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're really looking at how a business can thrive, um, I think it really does come back to how are the people who are working in that business themselves um, participating, managing. I think looking work workplaces are a critical place for us to be looking at mental health and wellbeing and looking at risk of suicide and suicide protective factors. It's critical. Um, so, and we now have a diversity of workplaces, of course, because people are working from home and working in different mm. places. But I think that would have to be the answer, Keith, that if you're really looking for how your business can thrive, it really comes down to saying at the end of the day, it's about your people and how are you working with your people and helping look after your people. And if I go to a factory or I go to a business, an office, we have the person who's the first aid person. Yes. If there's a fire goes off, if that goes off, but should we not be saying we need to have people looking out for people's um, mental well-being in the Absolutely. workplace? And that's a big piece of work we're trying to do. So the federal government has funded what we call our National Workplace Initiative that we're working on. And that really is to try and say, how can we make any workplace, whether it's a sole trader, um, or whether it is one of our uh, multinationals, mm -hmm. how can we actually introduce this concept mm -hmm. of mental health and wellbeing? And I think it's not just looking at how can we stop people becoming mentally unwell, but I think a really foundational piece for our nation, Keith, for our families, our communities, our nation, is that if we actually invest in our mental health and wellbeing, mm. we unlock our true potential. Mm. So I think it's actually not just about how much money are we spending on fixing the problem. It's actually how much are we prepared to invest in mental health and wellbeing as the truly foundational piece mm. for unlocking, unlocking where we can go as a country or as a community or as a family or as a business. And coming back, Rebecca, to your core uh, purpose as an organisation, a peak body, working with people like ourselves, mm. coming back to suicide quite directly, what are the economic concerns that you have in that particular area? I guess, Keith, are you, are you referring to more broadly what are the economic concerns around suicide or right now what are we concerned about? Both of those. Economics? Let's take the Both first things. one. Let's take, Let's the, take the first one. one. So uh, taking a broad perspective, we know from uh, previous recessions, including the GSC, mm -hmm. that they're particularly in industries that have been hit hard and where there's a loss of jobs, where there's businesses shutting down, that there has been an increase in suicidal behaviour. So that, that's, that's borne out by the evidence. Um, 
that's something that we, we found during our literature review and there's people who are far more highly qualified and trained than myself who have, who have drawn those conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, I think in relation to this crisis, it's similar. Um, COVID-19 is a public health issue, but it's having ramifications for the world economy. We're not seeing that free passage, and my background is, is business policy, so it's something I'm keenly interested in. Uh, we're seeing the, uh, the free passage of goods and services somewhat hindered. We're seeing people, uh, whole industries like tourism, for example, international tourism, grind to a halt. So of course that's going to have an impact on our economy. And if we're drawing from the experience of those previous big financial crises, uh, we shouldn't be predicting but we could uh, foresee that there may be an impact on suicidal behaviour. And I think that's the perspective we're coming from at Suicide Prevention Australia. We know that uh, governments have, they have to strike a balance. So governments have to strike a balance between fiscal responsibility and supporting workplaces and businesses. We live in a free market economy We, we uh, businesses also have their own, you know, concern to keep themselves thriving and, and going. Uh, but I think in a, in a crisis like this where, um, uh, situations like border restrictions are happening and industries are being drawn to a close through no fault, well not fault of their own, through no action no. of their own, we need to see a targeted response and that's why I guess we've said to government, uh, JobKeeper of course is not something that you can sustain forever but perhaps it could be a consideration for government to think about continuing a targeted version of JobKeeper past September. That's one of the things we've asked to consider. And then in relation to JobSeeker, the coronavirus supplement is a significant supplement. We haven't asked for that supplement to continue wholesale, but we are saying, can government consider raising the base rate of JobSeekers so that people, I guess, uh, People who haven't seen a real increase to that support, I think since 1994, there hasn't been an increase in the base rate. Uh, people can see that support increase. And I have to say that um, it's not just Suicide Prevention Australia saying these things. The business community has swung behind uh, these calls to action. So we're really, we're really piggybacking on, on some of those big voices that are out there already in this space. And in my own area, Wesley Mission, I'm very conscious that words like isolation and distancing I never think, we thought we'd be using these words with the, with the rapidity that they appear in programs and conversations and articles as they do today. But all of those things are factors that certainly impact upon people's mental health. And certainly they are issues that are very real. I'm often, when I go around the country and meet people with setting up new networks, you, you look at the situations that might shall we say, not encourage, but create the context in which some of these difficult things that we talk about happen. And isolation is one of them. And if we're living in a, a, a community now where we're telling people, stay apart, don't do, all those things are, are really, and you know, this is a difficult one. When we say to everybody, just stay with your family, the family is often the place where, oh, where yeah. some of this stuff is at its worst That's in terms right. of <laughs> aggression and, 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 and lack of... of, of uh, so maybe some good things, we hope, will come out of it. What about... This is a question for both of you. I'll start with you, Christine. What about the role of the media in, in, in all of this? Because, gosh, there's been some... There's been some good media, I have yeah. to say. Um, but there's been some shocking stuff as well, really, uh, and, and uh, we won't identify the papers and the places, <laughs> but uh, they've got an important role to play, haven't they? Media have an absolutely critical role to play. I think that I see it in two ways. I see, firstly, they are our social barometer. They, they know what will garner interest, what people will want to talk about. Mm. Um, so they are our social barometer. They, have, they do create conversation. You know, whatever means of media we're talking about, whether it's social media, whether it's print media, whether it's TV, film, whatever it may be, um, it is an opportunity to create conversation. It's an opportunity to influence people. Mm -hmm. And I think probably now, more so than at many other times in history, um, that mm -hmm. responsibility, I think, is something that really needs to be acknowledged. And yes, they can and should provide a range of um, views, opinions, etc. But I bring it back to suicide prevention. We know that probably the, the most challenging thing for us to deal with for those who work in trying to, uh, to help people avoid those, those crises is to not have alarmist conversations happening. So I think that is but an example of it. So I think um, it is critical. I think that um, some people are, 
are skeptical and they will go searching for truth, mm. others will actually believe those sound bites. Mm. And so I think there is a really heightened sense of responsibility, Keith, in, mm. in the media and how the media um, sort of absolves itself of that. The right use of language is so important, isn't it? I've spent 15 years trying to have interviews about suicide and say, please don't use the term commit suicide. That's right. And yeah. still, we're still doing it now, we're still it, still after doing. all these mm -hmm. years. So we've got a big task on our, our plate, I think, really, but we mustn't give up on it. I think as people get it, they do mm. get it. You really get it once you get it. Well, but... you do, don't you? But, <laughs> but I think, and I think you're right, and I think that <coughs> the one thing media can do is to be really conscious of the language it uses, but I think it can also, um, there's a long way to go towards destigmatizing. And that's another area the media has such a key role to play. So um, it's not just what they do, it's how they do it, which I think is critical. And the voices of lived experience is important. Uh, when we've had uh, events where we, we've asked people who have lost loved ones or been themselves on the point of taking their own lives, uh, bringing their life, which has been to that point important to a close, um, you realise that lived experience and families you know, are so powerful uh, in terms of trying to provide a, a positive voice in the middle of it all. Have you found that yourself as you've talked to oh. the many agencies? Oh, absolutely. It, it, certainly the voice of lived experience needs to be at the centre of any conversation about suicide prevention. So I have to say it would be fantastic if we had someone here with us today to share their, their story of lived experience because it adds so much mm -hmm. power and weight and realness to anything that we say about suicide. Um, there was a terrific piece in the ABC the other day that shared uh, the lived experience story of one of our own amb ambassadors at SPA and I think he's also worked with Wesley Mission in the past, Graham Holdsworth. Mm -hmm. um, he shared his very powerful story of lived experience and he was someone who experienced financial distress, relationship breakdown, all those, all those interconnected problems that we know can lead someone down that path. Um, but going to your early point, Keith, around uh, the role of the media, safe language, uh, responsible reporting, one of the surprising things we found uh, with um, conducting this paper is we commissioned an independent analysis of media and we found that of course there was some negative coverage. I mean, absolutely, that's in incontrovertible. Um, but coverage, um, a significant proportion of coverage was either neutral or, and, and surprising amount was positive. Mm. And we found that a large reason why that was the case is because government had been so proactive in Australia with sharing and promoting fact-based sources of advice. So things like the COVID Safe app, uh, things like the Department of Health website mm. that were just up there and running and available to people. Um, and uh, that's what we also found with other pandemics that um, in the Netherlands, for example, where they didn't have access to similarly fact-based sources of information, the media engaged in much more dangerous, um, scary and heightened discussions mm. about uh, the virus and also about the mental health impact. So mm. I think I'm trying to, I guess, share another positive message, which is our media is doing not a bad job during this crisis, and that's in large thanks to in the any, sources they have. In any yep. pandemic, that there are there are ways in which we can uh, respond creatively to what's there. Mm. Now I know that initially slated to end in June 20, the Australian government's. Um, response to suicide prevention trial sites mm -hmm. uh, was an important... Do you want to tell us a little bit about what they are, Christine? Yes, so, thank you. So the trial sites, and, and people may be amazed to know there's actually 30 trial sites around Australia now. And what we're really looking at there, and it's a combination of some of the trial sites are running what we call the lifespan model, and some what we call the European Alliance model, or some variants of it. Mm. What we're really looking at doing is to say, look, we, we know we've got the models of suicidal behaviour. Um, Joyner's model, and Kane's model, and um, Rory O'Connor's model of suicidal behaviour. We know we've got evidence-based interventions, but we need to really look at what does that look like mm -hmm. in terms of regional community settings. Um, and they're, they're really interventions which are coming from a combined uh, perspective of health, mental health and community-based. So how effective are those trials? And I guess two questions we're particularly interested in is to say that all of them have uh, different components, whether it's eight or 12 different components. And we're really interested long-term in saying, what of those components are really critical and really importantly I think for the work we're trying to do in the task force is what uh, what what 
what does a community need to have in order to enable it to actually bring those interventions into place? So they're really trials to say, if we try and empower the community more effectively with evidence-based interventions, can we actually move upstream and prevent those suicidal um, crises? And the last time we talked, we talked about the First Peoples in, mm. amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island. It's an important area there, isn't it? Critical. Absolutely critical. So um, again, we know that if we're really going to reach anybody, you need to do it on their terms, not our terms. Mm. That's an absolute fundamental. Mm. And so if we look at our First Nation people, if we look at our um, Indigenous communities, they need to be integrally involved in identifying what would work for them and how to actually implement that. And it is a crisis for them. And it's one that they they grapple with so um, so strongly. And it's it's heartbreaking, Keith. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely heartbreaking. So, um, so that is a critical area. We know that suicide death rates for our Indigenous people are twice the rate. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it's a leading cause of death for young um, Indigenous people. So that's one of our critical, critical points. We're coming towards the final few minutes of our conversation mm -hmm. together. Uh, it's good that we've been able to to have this conversation. It's been good for, for Wesley Mission to be able to work in this partnership with yourselves. Uh, what are the things that we can learn from a project like this? Well, I've certainly learned a lot personally about collaboration. Um, I think Suicide Prevention Australia, uh, our whole reason for being, I talked about reason for being from a policy perspective, but our reason for being as an organisation is to voice the needs and uh, the ideas and the priorities of the suicide prevention sector. So I think this report is a real example of what we should be doing more of. Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, from our perspective, I think I learned so much partnering with Wesley Mission because of your incredibly long history in working with people in all different scenarios of life, whether they're homeless, whether they're uh, veterans needing support, whether they're looking for a job. So it was just incredible to be drawing on such a rich source of intelligence and partnering with people who really understood what the issues are in the community. So I can read and digest literature just like anybody else, but I'm not working directly with those communities. And I was very privileged to be able to work with people who have had that experience. So um, I have to give thanks to James Bell and his team who were my partners in this project and our partners in this project. Um, and as I said, yeah, the key learning I think for us as, a, as an organisation was we need to work with uh, all of our members, of course, but particularly with those members who are working intimately with the vulnerable members of our community because that's who we're here to help. But Rebecca, the helicopter matters as well, doesn't it? To be able to look down at, right. at, a, at a panoply a picture of what's happening yes. in, in the area. So thank you for, the, for, for working together. Christine, any, any final thoughts from you? Final thoughts. I think, firstly, I would say on mental health. Um, and I think the pandemic is really bringing this home to us. And it was brought home in the bushfires as well. Our mental health is as much a part of our humanity as our physical health. Mm -hmm. It is something that we all own and it is capable of being affected. That's the first thing. So I think recognising that and recognising that just like we look after our physical health, we need mm -hmm. to look after our mental health is really critical. Mm -hmm. When it comes to suicide, suicide ideation, suicide crisis, it really is, unfortunately, a lot more common than many people believe. Um, the first step, the most fundamental step, is connection with someone else. You talked about that you'd had, um, you had never had so many t conversations around distancing. I so agree with that, Keith. And what we tried to do at the beginning of the pandemic was change the reference to social distancing. Absolutely. So we called it physical distancing with social connection. Yeah. And as I've worked over these last few months, I think the, the thing that has come home to me so strongly is the power of social connection. That if we find the way to stay connected with another and we can have hope, mm. then there is a way through. Mm. Well, thank you for, for sharing with us. We've got a, a, a large amount of material and a large uh, area of work uh, in what we've talked about today in our conversation. It's probably um, what we want to be saying. It's a whole of community response. Um, Organisations delivering services, those people seeking empirical and, and, and evidential uh, ways of looking at this and government who have the job of, of, of working at from, from that level. It's, it's all of us together. Mm. Um, 
you know, that song that talks about us all in together, I mean, it had gone off the charts, hadn't it? Nobody had listened to it. Everybody's singing it now, aren't they? Because mm -hmm. we are in it together. That's and right. if, if it's going to be done, anything that's there. So thank you, Christine, thank for you. coming along and sharing with us and back on your old stamping ground, as it Absolutely. were. Absolutely. <laughs> at Wesley Mission. We're delighted that, to have had you uh, with us. And, and not only your work with government, but the important work that you do in the organisation that is part of your particular heart and and also to you Rebecca thank you ever so thank much you. and if you've been watching the program and if in any way you've been affected by the conversation we want to be able to offer help to you and to say to you that you are not alone that there are people out there that want to offer care and concern I particularly want to um, express thanks to those that are here but thanking those of you at home that have taken the time mm. to share with us in this particular programme today. Thank you to all our viewers. Uh, we want to encourage you to continue the discussion online, in social media, spread it wherever you can, because the more we talk about it, the more we might be able to find positive ways forward together.